This video was brought to you by Brilliant. Get 20% off by being one of the first 200 people to sign up at brilliant.org slash slidebean. Big name companies are boycotting Facebook, yet another controversy, but should we be surprised? If we look at history, not really. Ever since its inception, even before it was Facebook, it had pushed the boundaries of ethics. Facebook is the subject of love, and loathe, but it's still the most significant social network with billions of users worldwide. It's so big that experts say it's immune to controversy, but for how long? What does the future hold for Facebook? Let's talk about it in this company forensics. The origins. The year is 2003. We are at Harvard University where second year student Mark Zuckerberg built a website called FaceMash in which users decided which of two students, mostly if not all women, was hotter by voting on dueling pictures. FaceMash was a hit, 450 visitors and 22,000 views in the first four hours, but it was taken down in days. The university accused Zuckerberg of violating individual privacy and breaching security and almost expelled him. To get the pictures, he hacked university student ID directories called Facebooks always ethical, Mark. But he didn't stop there. Instead, he created his version of the student directories called The Facebook and partnered with Eduardo Saverin, another Harvard student, who invested $1,000 to get it up and running. They both launched it on February 4th, 2004. Now here's a side note. Zuckerberg had told three seniors, the Winklevoss twins, and Devian Narendra that he would help them create harvardconnection.com, eventually called ConnectU, another social network which worked in very similar ways. So when they launched The Facebook, the three accused him of stealing the idea. This chapter deserves a video of its own, or a movie, but in summary, the three took Zuckerberg to court and eventually settled for around $300 million. The Facebook grew fast. Within a month, half of Harvard students had signed up. To help manage the growth, Zuckerberg asked Dustin Moskowitz, Andrew McCollum, and Chris Hughes to join him. They changed the name to Facebook and were on their way to creating a giant. Eventually, all of them left, except for Zuckerberg. Facebook caught the eye of some big names like Peter Thiel of PayPal fame, who invested $500,000 in late 2004. The next year, Facebook received $13 million in investment, and none other than Sean Parker, who had created Napster, became the company's president. In 2006, Facebook launched its news feed, an essential feature for its future. Users could now see what their friends were up to in real time. Then they opened the floodgates. Anyone older than 13 with an email address could now join. Growth. By October 2007, Facebook was so popular that none other than Microsoft decided to invest $250 million for 1.6% in the company and the right to advertise internationally. With this, Facebook's valuation reached $15 billion, but it was also the first step towards real Zuckerberg's goal. He wanted Facebook to become an advertising magnet, and it would be to good and bad consequences. In 2007, Facebook allowed for app development within the social network. A big hit in just one year, it already had 33,000 exclusive apps. Two years later, the like button was born, a digital drug, a gateway substance into endless comparison and FOMO. Think about it. Apps, photos, real-time comments, instant private messaging, and now, constant approval from your friends and strangers alike. People were hooked like addicts. By 2010, 500 million people had signed up. By 2012, the number was 1 billion. That same year, Facebook acquired Instagram for $1 billion, which is a steal. Two years later, they bought WhatsApp for $19 billion. Of course, such growth brought difficulties. Just think about it. Millions of users posting whatever they want, companies advertising like crazy, and rampant app development. Add to this, news sites within Facebook, political parties, and political ads. It was Pandora's box. Since 2011, Facebook has removed an average of 20,000 photographs, which violated standards such as spam, graphic content, and underage use per day. But what users did within Facebook was nothing compared to what Facebook did to users. Controversies. In 2018, 2.2 billion people around the world used Facebook, and companies wanted to reach those billions of people. How? That's where it gets tricky. 
let's do a timeline. Maybe you guys remember Farmville. In 2010, the Wall Street Journal revealed that this addicting game and many other apps leaked user IDs to advertising companies. In turn, these tracked and targeted those users regardless of privacy settings to sell or promote products and services. Then came the internet.org project in 2013. Their goal, internet for everybody. Data, he said, was like water and food, a universal right. Oh, that's noble. But many compared the idea to an internet colonialism. An open letter accused Facebook of building a walled garden in which the world's poorest people will only be able to access a limited set of insecure websites and services. Ouch. In 2014, Facebook copied the trending topics feature present on Twitter. At first, it was a hit, but with the 2016 US elections, it became an epicenter of controversy. Former Facebook employees revealed that they routinely censored conservative news. This is where the term fake news gains tons of traction, especially when Donald Trump became the 45th president of the United States. Severe accusations followed, such as that Facebook helped him become president. There was evidence of data theft, news manipulation, and micro targeting. So Zuckerberg was brought into the Senate to explain just what the hell was going on. And his reply was, we didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility and that was a big mistake. Right. But hey, at least Facebook released reactions. Perhaps it was an attempt to give users a voice, a muffled voice, that is, because it's faster to click than to type. Now, the controversies weren't only within the United States. In 2017, Facebook was accused, get this, of ethnic cleansing. The Myanmar army was in an all-out campaign to eradicate the Rohingya Muslim minority. In response, Rohingya insurgent groups appeared all around, but Facebook labeled these groups as dangerous organizations, then deleted content that praised them or supported them. Myanmar military forces have a verified Facebook page. Zuckerberg sure knows how to outdo himself. Cambridge Analytica and other data leaks. Cambridge Analytica was a company that worked with data from mining it and brokering it to analyzing it all to optimize strategic communication during political and electoral processes. The controversy surfaced in 2018, but as investigations continued, it turned out that Cambridge Analytica worked in campaigns as far back as 2015, with some of their clients being Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and the Leave.eu campaign, a pro-Brexit organization. But where does Facebook come into play? Cambridge Analytica used data that came from Facebook. But Zuck Zuckerberg claims that they were tricked by a consultant who promised he would be using the data for academic research. Well, quite a trick that was. It turns out Cambridge Analytica wasn't only involved in the US elections, but also in the United Kingdom, Mexico, Malta, Kenya, and India, just to name a few. And Facebook insisted on the trickery bit, but evidence piled on. So Cambridge Analytica turned on its defenses and said that the micro-targeting helped the voters be more informed about topics of personal interest. So in their eyes, this justified collecting personal data and private information without consent. Initial estimates suggested around 50 million compromised accounts, but it ended up being more in the range of 90 million at least. In keeping consistent, accusations linked Facebook with tampering with the Philippine elections. Zuckerberg had to testify before the Senate, but his overly apologetic and elusive replies were pretty disappointing. At least he said he was sorry and he promised to cooperate with the US-Russia election investigation. And Facebook did take action. They increased securities and changed algorithm parameters. Plus, the Federal Trade Commission fined them a hefty $5 billion for violating users' privacy. But these actions feel underwhelming, which is why we are here. Latest happenings. 2020 has not been a good year for Facebook, as it has been unable to shake off its reputation, doing very little to help itself as a brand. And let's not forget, this is election year. But it's not only about the election. Racism, police brutality, and inequality has led to protests all over the US and all over the world. Trump's comments have only fueled the fire and people expect social networks to do something. But at first, Zuckerberg stated that Facebook wouldn't take action, stating that, I know many people are upset that we've left the president's posts up, but our position is that we should enable as much expression as possible unless it will cause an imminent risk of specific harms or dangers spelled out in clear policies. He believed that people had to view posts and decide on their own what to believe. This comment, of course, drew fire from all fronts, especially because Twitter did take action against Trump's comments, placing warnings on his tweets for glorifying violence. Big name companies took notice, like Verizon, YouTube, Condé Nast, Vice, and even Coca-Cola. They considered that Facebook had basically failed in handling hate speech and moderation. So they decided to stop advertising on the platform and were not talking about 
small amounts. Verizon, for example, spent $1.5 million a month. Even Facebook employees expressed disappointment and frustration. On June 1st, many of them didn't show up for work and created automated emails that clearly stated they were protesting the lack of action. And by June 18th, it seemed that Facebook had reacted. It removed around 80 ads placed by the Trump campaign for the use of imagery related to Nazism. Then the company stated that it would ban all ads that present races and religions as threats. But this will only affect paid ads and not individual non-monetized posts. So the past repeats itself. These actions seem somewhat deficient. To top it all off, Facebook had the strongest quarter at the end of 2019, even exceeding expectations. At the end of it all, Facebook has around 8 million advertisers and $70.7 .7 billion in revenue last year. So some say the boycott might not work. Even though it seems fewer people are using Facebook, it still has 2.4 billion plus users. This is a company that pushes boundaries of ethics in a world that's changing rapidly and violently. So one has to wonder if one day they'll push too far. Now, this is a true story. I am completely starstruck that Brilliant sponsored today's video. I first discovered Brilliant a couple years ago through one of my favorite YouTube channels, Half as Interesting, and I could not have dreamed that only a couple of years later, I'd be talking about them in our own channel. So the reason why I love Brilliant when I tried it was that it really transforms that mindless Facebook scrolling into pretty awesome exercises that help you learn to think critically. Running a company is about problem solving every single day, except if you get it wrong, well, you're out of a job. I have to stay on top, and that is why I wanna focus on something different to get my mind off work. And I've been using Brilliant to further develop my analytical thinking. Brilliant is free to sign up, no credit cards or anything. And if you wanna supercharge your skill set, the guys from Brilliant agreed to offer a 20% discount to the first 200 people to sign up at brilliant.org slash slightly. Link in the description. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next week.